in uh, welcoming Adrian with a round of applause. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. Yesterday I was uh, getting my bags here ready to come down or something Sunday, and my daughter, I have a uh, how old is she now? Four year old, my four year old daughter came up to me and just said, uh, What you doing, Daddy? And I said, oh, I'm going down to Chiba for the night. She sort of looked at me and said, You sly dog. You're going to Disneyland, aren't you? <laughs> and I said, No, I'm going to the Kanda University of International Studies. And she just sort of looked at me with this blank look on her face. Okay, have fun. Give me a souvenir. And that's about it. But, you know what, what a great setup. I think it's very impressive that the international language sort of set up here and opportunities for students is, is fantastic. And uh, I think the next family trip will certainly be a couple of stations beyond Disneyland over towards the, uh, the university here. Uh, my name is Adrian Lees uh, from the University of Education. Uh, I don't have any paper slides because it's a paperless conference, but uh, if you have time to uh, download the uh, slides from this QR code, or you can also visit my blog, adrianlees.weebly.com, where I put them up uh, yesterday, uh, including uh, an example of the uh, uh, flipped classroom and a script that I'll talk about a little bit later on. And I also will do a, uh, a video presentation of this once again and put it onto the blog uh, next week if you're uh, interested in having a look at that or cannot get to sleep. Are we good? Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, today's menu, basically, what I'm going to talk about is a very broad sort of uh, topic. A lot of today's presentations, which have been fantastic, are really focusing on one or two particular areas. And uh, I've, I've really enjoyed the ones I've been to so far. Unfortunately, we can't get to all of them. And I'm still looking for a broader range, attitudes to using technology, for all these fantastic ideas. But if the teachers don't want to use them, then what good are they? And how I've used tablets and uh, my technology and teacher training, looking at mo mobile phones, how we use mobile phones, uh, social networking systems, teaching tech, uh, Teaching to, using technology to teach deaf and hard of hearing students, which we can't say to students, I'm sorry, you are deaf, you cannot take this class. It's, we legally cannot say that. So how I've sort of approached that situation this year, and my ideas for the future research, where I'm going to go through, go to from now. Uh, today's presentation is not one way. If you have a Twitter account, or if, you're, uh, if you don't have a Twitter account, it's okay as well. Please feel free to share your thoughts and feelings and opinions on Twitter as I'm speaking. Or um, just put up your hand. If there's something that you'd like me to, to cover again, or if you have a question, please don't hesitate to uh, ask me as I'm talking. So attitudes towards technology. It started about, it's actually about 2010. And I was just wondering, looking at all this technology coming through, the iPads have just come out. And I think, well, how do teachers feel about this? Teachers want to use this. What sort of difficulties will they find? And so I looked at uh, 118 elementary school teachers in uh, northern Japan, and just asked them, "What do you feel about it?" I had a, a, a questionnaire set up, and basically what I found is that teachers generally seem to have a positive attitude to using technology in the classroom. They think it's a good idea. However, it's time-consuming. It takes time, they've got all these students to look after, they've got uh, students' parents to worry about, they've got the, the teacher's aide who's sick, and then they have to make these extra things on the computer. So it's very time consuming they're finding for their students. What was surprising was that male teachers aged 31 to 40 had the most positive attitudes towards using technology. This was surprising because I felt maybe the younger generation would be more interested in. They would have more positive attitudes. When I thought about it, these male, between 31 and 40, my age group, we grew up at the perfect age for all these revolutionary changes in technology over the last couple of years. In the 1980s, when I was in the upper years of elementary school, the Atari Famicom game came out, which was hugely popular here in Japan especially. Uh, Windows 95 just when all these age groups are into university. They've got the time, as university students seem to have the time, 
to, uh, to organize and to, to learn how to use this. They're into the workforce they're using in those 2000 millennia, or XP. So they're at the perfect age for all these changes in technology, and they've experienced life without technology. Furthermore, they've got the teaching experience. The younger ones, they're still worried about how to teach and whether they're good enough in the classroom or not. So I sort of figured that more training is needed for university students wanting to become teachers in the future, especially English teachers, because that's what I do. So I bought a couple of iPads. Well, I didn't buy my university president bought 200, 200? Sorry, that's an exaggeration. This was this big. We bought 40 iPads. And uh, what happened is that the, uh, I gave it to the students for a whole year, and the entire class was done only on the iPad. There's no paper involved before. In the first year only with eight students, eight students in the first year, uh, we saved about 3,000 pieces of paper. In this next year we have 35 students, uh, we're saving more and more paper obviously. And what's happened is that students are now having a much better attitude towards using technology in the classroom. Uh, it's, if you're in statistics, uh, it's a significantly different here is what we're seeing with the students. They're much more positive in their attitudes. Now, the applications that we downloaded were nothing special. I shouldn't say they're nothing special, they're great. But they're nothing that we need to build ourselves, something we need to make ourselves. And this is something I wanted to do on purpose. I didn't want to overload them with, with new jargon, new words, and new ways of making applications. So it's the simple applications, for example, Keynote, Twitter for uh, SNS, sort of uh, my chatting outside of class time, Google Earth for the students who wanted to use Google Earth when teaching culture in their classes, in their model lessons. iBooks, just for general extensive reading. There are plenty of, of classic books for free on, uh, through iBooks. Read, good Reader was our PDF uh, viewer. So having Good Reader in there, which was the only one that cost anything. I think it was 400 yen when we, when we purchased it. Uh, good Reader, so students could take memos on the, uh, and, and highlight things on the PDF that they were downloading. Sync Space, uh, a, a whiteboard for your iPad that can easily be the, what the students are writing during our uh, discussions can easily be shared through Twitter using Sync Space. Dictionary, one of the top five applications ever. And iTunes University, just for students encouraging them to study in their own time. So how the students did it was first they, uh, they had their iPads. When we gave the students an iPad, they were asked to sign a contract that they wouldn't download any applications without my permission, uh, just, just for, for safety's sake. They used their keynote to make a presentation. And this was then changed into a PDF. Presentations were, uh, and model lessons were based on the textbook that we were, we were using. It's a, uh, it was a teaching methodologies class, fourth year university students and first year university students. Uh, from the uh, PDF, it was then put into a Dropbox, which was shared by our class. And students were able to copy and paste into their own uh, Good Reader. From there, during the class, while the student was giving a presentation or model lesson, they could do the activities, take memos, do whatever they wanted. So what had done, been previously done on paper was now all being done on the iPad, where the students could use it any time, including now, one of the first students in the, the first time we did this is now teaching here, actually in Chibab and still able to access the information that he got through his Dropbox. And this is basically how it looks. Here are some of my students. Uh, this student uh, just yesterday, that's what I was taking, is doing a model lesson here and having the students doing conversations, discussions, using their iPad, using uh, space to do it this time. Again, similar sort of situation where students are discussing or doing activities using their iPad. Mobile phones. I was, oh, I'm always surprised to ha see how many teachers ban or still ban mobile phones during the class. Uh, very, very surprising. And, well, the students still use them anyway. Right? They're under the desks, they're, they're, they're emailing their friends anyway. So why not actually use them for the benefit of the students? We wrote a paper about this, uh, Simon Cook, the Joe, you know, and I, and, uh, I told him, wrote a paper just looking at how much using iPhones is beneficial for students and for teachers. 
and using the mobile phones in class compared to classes where students did not use mobile phones, the students studied much, much more. 144 minutes per week was the average the students studied compared with 82 minutes per week, where students were prohibited from using their mobile phones in class. Now again, we wanted to keep this as simple as possible. We don't want teachers to be overwhelmed with difficult uh, activities or applications to do. So we just used what the students already had in their phones anyway. Do some videoing, some pronunciation practice, and some video chatting. The first one, the videoing. Uh, during my English conversation classes, we do a lot of role plays. Basically what happens is the students do a practice, they sit down, they discuss their practice. How did they do it? What do they need to improve? Then they practice again and they perform their role plays in front of the class. One of the problems is though, when they're sitting down and discussing how to improve their own role play, they can't see themselves, they can't see their facial expression. They can't see how their body is moving. They can't see if their shoulders on one side or not because they can't see their own face. Using video, having other students videotape themselves, they were then able to do this, watch the video, and improve their own ability a little bit more. Here's just a short uh, excerpt of what we're doing in class. <laughs> Once the uh, video had finished each group, then they sat down and they looked at their videos. They're using their uh, medical skills to think about how to improve their own ability. see their own performance, but they could also see their own improvement. In April, when the course began, the students videotaped each other, performing in English. And usually, we ask the students to delete, because it takes a lot of memory, these videos, delete their, their videos. But in April, they were asked only the first time to keep their role play video on, on their phones. And then in July, at the end of the semester, they were able to compare their performance in April and their performance in July. And this is a big thing for student motivation. They can see their improvement. What I couldn't do yesterday, I can do today. I was that bad in April, but now look at me. And that's where the motivation comes up. Also, many students found themselves, when they're bored on the, on the train, they would look at their performance again on the train. And that made a big difference for students' performance. The second one was uh, pronunciation practice through Dragon Dictation. And I believe there's a presentation uh, after this on Dragon Dictation, so I don't want to get into this too much. But it's a fantastic application where students are able to, rather than if you have 40 students in your class, rather than the teacher trying to check the pronunciation of every single student, which is obviously not practical, they're able to sit down and actually practice it themselves. Dragon dictation I found to be very, very accurate. Very accurate, and uh, this is my, my example. Uh, able to pick up the end of the sentence, where stu Japanese students, because of their rhythm dis differences, between Japanese, which often finishes with an open syllable, the ka, ki, ku, often the mouth is open at the end of the Japanese words. And in English, where often the mouth the, the, has a, a consonant vowel consonant rhythm in, in English, where it finishes with a closed mouth. So this is also very good at catching the ends of the words, which enables the students to improve their pronunciation even further. Now, I don't want to talk about this too much again, because there will be another presentation after about this. But uh, driving dictation is fantastic. And I'll get back to that one a little bit later on as well. Uh, finally, using Skype. Yes, Skype is free. And we did some chatting between our students and some students in Korea. Uh, a lot of people have done this chatting on Skype before. The same time frame is definitely a must. Uh, if, you have some, if you're chatting between here and the United States, for example, somebody's going to be at 2 o'clock in the morning. And nobody wants to speak English at 2 o'clock in the morning. 
So uh, Skype, really, really good uh, opportunity for students to make new friends to speak English with another uh, student of English. And it, it's free. The students, it's easy to do. We didn't have the students, though. Many, many of them had their own Skype accounts. For the purpose of this class, we did have them make uh, a special name just for this class, just for uh, privacy reasons. Uh, social networking, using Twitter. There was a presentation earlier about using Facebook. And social networking was very good. Only for students who were confident in their own English ability. And I found this to be uh, something that needs to be worked on in the future with when I do this again. This year I'm going to be using Line rather than Twitter, uh, just for it's trendier, more students are using it, it's quicker, and this just seems to be more interesting with all the uh, icons. So that's going to be a, a little bit of a challenge for this year, see how Line goes. Also with Line, uh, sorry, this year I'll be adding a rubric of how many times students actually participate in it. So it doesn't matter about the accuracy of their tweets or what they're saying, more what is important is how much they're doing it and the content. This I'll be doing not with the English conversation class, but with the uh, cultures class. And the book we're going to be using is Malcolm Gladwell's David and Goliath, his latest book. And because it's quite a difficult book for my students, they'll be able to ask each other questions. I'll throw in a few questions as we're going as well. What was really good about using Twitter is because we do presentations in our class, the person who's presenting ask students to give their opinion, what to prepare if they were going to join her presentation. And this brings us to the deaf and hard of hearing students. Has anyone ever taught deaf or hard of hearing students before? It's quite a challenge. Uh, generally our students will hear English like this. This is how they hear the English. It's a nice day, let's go for a walk. I'm sure you can all read it. This is how we hear language. Now, generally, in hard of hearing, there are different levels, of course, but uh, there are two major groups that you'll find. First will be a group like this, who will, uh, if you read this sentence, does it come up there? Oh, there it is. Okay. This sentence, you're straining your eyes, looking forward, trying to work out, you can see a couple of words, that's what their hearing is like. It's very muffled, it's very, very deep, and they're, they're trying to hear exactly what you're saying. They can't hear that you're saying, it's raining today, let's read a book, but they can sort of hear you saying, today, let's, this. they can sort of work it out, but it takes time, it takes time. The other way that uh, hard of hearing students hear becomes very chunky. It's sort of like this. Or again, they can hear the words, but it's sort of static. It's like listening to a radio at, at 3 o'clock in the morning. They can't see, or it takes them time to work out. Okay, here's the word skiing. I can sort of see snow. Okay, it has snowed heaps. Let's go skiing. It's what they work out after a while. It takes time for them to work out. And this was one of the difficulties of teaching uh, deaf and hard of hearing students. I had two students in my class this year. A uh, group of 30 students, 28 of whom could hear perfectly, and two, one was completely deaf, could not hear a thing, and the other one was like this. Uh, however, she could lip read if I spoke in Japanese. When I spoke Japanese, she could lip read. When I spoke in English, she couldn't lip read. Very interesting girl to teach. So how I handled it was, in the past, uh, a teacher who had where it was in charge of these students before, used a very analog way. She had lots of paper. There were note takers. Somebody would sit down beside the students, listen to everything that was being said, take notes, show it to the hard of hearing students, who then, okay, then give it back and write their own ideas. And that's how it went. Now, this was okay for a class which is conducted in Japanese, because the note takers can hear. But if the note takers don't understand what the teacher is saying in English, how can they pass on that information to the hard of hearing student? And that's where the problems come in. Some teachers have used, they have a big, a big chart. They say, I'm saying instruction number one, or I'm saying instruction number three, and talk with your partner, share your ideas. So to get around that, and to make, try to make it quicker and easier, especially with English, I started off by using drag and dictation. Where I get my 
with the iPad. I speak, hi, how are you today? You come out perfectly and show it to the students. And that was great. That was really good. That worked very well. However, when it came to class, if I said something like, OK, everybody, now please read together in pairs, or something like that, the other 28 students would start reading loud, whereas these students would then be looking at my memo, working it out, saying, OK. They would be a couple of steps behind the other students. So whereas uh, Dragon Dictation was very good, it just wasn't, the, the students weren't at the same speed as the other students. And that was a concern for both them, myself, and their, their supervisors. So I looked into uh, some other speech-to-text software, and Mac uh, Mountain Lion, I think it started with Mountain Lion, but had the speech-to-text software in the um, systems preferences. There's the little microphone in the bottom, and it's speech-to-text. So you don't need to type emails in there. You can just put that on, choose your accent, Canadian, English, British, sorry, Australian, American. I don't think they have New Zealand, but uh, that doesn't matter. No curiosity. Uh, but uh, that was really good. That was working very well. But again, the accuracy was very good. Accuracy was very good. However, there was a problem with Mountain Lion in that every time before I would speak, I would need to signal to the students. They would press FN twice. When I had finished, I signaled to the students again. They'd press Enter. Then the words would come up on the screen. Accuracy was OK. It was pretty good. But again, a little bit time consuming for the students and myself. Then Mavericks came up. Now there's been a lot of bad words, bad things said about Mavericks. Um, personally, touch wood, I've had no problems with it so far. So far, hopefully OK. But what happens with Mavericks now, there's no need to use FN or Enter every time. You press FN twice at the beginning, but as you are speaking, everything automatically comes out on the screen. And this is fantastic. If you're speaking to the computer, that's the next problem. Of course, I can't just stand next to my students, my, my DHH students, all lesson. I have 30 students in the classroom. I need to be able to speak to them, to all my students, and so they can hear what I'm saying. So I've got myself a little, uh, you know the microphones you have for your, your mobile phones when you're driving, that you can speak. I grab one of those. Uh, I try to get the best one I could. And it was, it was OK, but the accuracy went down to about 60%. And I found myself going over to the computer to check what had been said, what had been written on the screen. And there was some language there that if my mother heard me say that, <laughs> and she'd be like, wash, wash your mouth out with soap. Uh, so I found myself saying, to, I did not say that. I did not say that, and just quickly deleting. So there was a couple of problems with the, the microphone. It was good because it enabled me to walk around the classroom talking to students, while also they can hear me. It means everybody is part of the lesson, but the accuracy went down quite significantly. So the next step I thought was, well, how about flipped classrooms? Has anyone tried flipped classroom before? Kind of new. Yeah, there are, I, I kind of like the idea. And so what I've done with my uh, classes, what I'm doing now with my classes, is making a short video for each one. A short video in which while I'm flipping, what I do, normally do in class, explanation of the text, I've now put into a video, which I'll put onto my uh, YouTube page. So I'm just starting, and there's only one video on my YouTube page at the moment, which is this one. And uh, this, the students get a copy. They get the uh, URL, they get a QR code with the URL, they can go straight to my YouTube page, and they can see it. And this is for all of the students. So all the students get this flipped classroom. Only the DHH students get a copy of this script. So they get the script, so they can read the script as they're watching the video. And the script has slide number one, exactly what I am saying, because I'm reading this. I make this first as I'm, as, I'm, like, as I'm making the slides, and the students get this, and they're reading it as I'm going through the video. So they're hearing, or they're reading exactly what all the other students are hearing. And this, the students have really appreciated this. Not only the DHH students, but the regular students as well. Uh, so what does a flipped classroom look like? If you haven't seen one, let's Hi, take an example and of my classroom. To classroom for unit 11. This is the second last unit in this book. One and a half minutes. The title of this chapter is Testing and Evaluation.
Before we start into the chat, so there, so there is a short discussion topic for you to think about. So introducing discussion topics. I think most of you would agree. We talk about this class. So before class, like think about it. What are you going to do? Why what are you going to say? I'd like you to think about the reasons people dislike to take tests. We'll have a short discussion about this at the beginning of next class. These are the main points for this chapter. The third point, writing and evaluating achievement tests, is probably the most important for you to understand at this stage. As we go through the chapter, I'd like you to keep in mind that all evaluation should be done for the learner's benefit. We don't do this to make students nervous, but to help them learn better. Teaching a second or foreign language can be a difficult thing to do. However, as we have learned in this book, it is important to remember that the teacher's main job is to build his or her student's confidence in using that language. Tests should do the same. When making tests, we need to think whether they will help. We'll stop there before I talk to uh, So again, this is what happened. The video goes for about 10 minutes. If you're interested in having a look at the entire video, if you want to learn a little bit about more about testing and evaluation, please have a look at uh, through my website. My blog, sorry, you can get the access through there to the entire video. It's about 10 minutes. Now, one of the difficulty things is about timing and just a lot of trial and error with timing. You wouldn't have seen it, but there are actually quite a few little black dots coming up here as well, which are being, uh, like they're coming up into the screen to make the timing a little bit better. Uh, it does take time to make the video, I will admit that. Uh, the teacher's workload will be uh, a little bit higher at the beginning, but over time it will become easier and easier. So once the students have seen this video for homework, which is like preparing for class anyway, then when it gets to class time, we can now have discussions. We can do their homework in the classroom, which is what flipped classrooms are all about. Just watching a classroom uh, a, a video this morning about in North Carolina, I believe at the moment, there's a lot of problems with teaching, uh, teaching salaries, uh, I believe. And also students' uh, levels, the academic levels are, are going down. And they're introducing flipped classrooms and having some very positive uh, feedback from that. So that's where I see how I will be going with my uh, DHA students from here using technology. Again, QR codes will be used to make it easier for students. So finally from now, where do, I, where do we go from now? My future research. Uh, paperless classrooms and their effects on students' language proficiency. I've looked at their motivation, how much they study. Using mobile phones was positive because students studied more in class, it seemed. But how about their proficiency? It's no good for us to, you know, to, to use all this wonderful technology if it doesn't improve their proficiency. Maybe the paper textbooks are better for their proficiency. So this year, I, uh, I was lucky enough to get a grant from the government last year. So I'll be buying myself uh, about a dozen iPads. And I'll be doing a comparison of uh, Oxford University Press's books using their learner's bookshelf, which if you'd like to know more, I'm sure Ollie can give you the rundown of that one. And, um, and their paper version of the same textbook. I've been looking for this for ages, ages, to try, trying to find a, a book that was on the iPad and exactly the same on the paper version. I just could not find any. I found some good textbooks just on iPad, some textbooks just in the book, uh, just the paper version, but I just couldn't find anything that were exactly the same. And then, uh, actually it was at Jouts just last year, uh, I was able to find these ones here. It's good because the video, I expect the motivation and the study time of students will increase with the, uh, with the iPad version because they'll be able to access it anywhere. The videos will be in their iPads. In most versions, I think our lecture one series is quite heavy because so they're not, they're, they need to be online. But uh, they'll be able to access it anywhere. They'll be able to email me anytime. They'll be able to email me their answers, ask questions at any time. So I imagine that the, uh, the iPad version, the bookshelf, will be better for students' motivation. And I'll be looking at different vari uh, varieties of motivation, intrinsic, extrinsic. I'll be looking at uh, willingness to communicate. Also be looking at uh, ideal L2 selves, uh, Dornier's work, if you are familiar with it. And uh, just to see which is better from a motivational perspective. 
also from a uh, proficiency idea as well. Which of these is better for improving students' proficiency? Are the paper version better or the iPads better? Looking at the connections there as well. Finally, before we get into the discussion, I don't like the word question and answer because it, it, it sort of implies that I know all the answers, but uh, finally, I think that e-learning technology is fantastic, but in the end, the students, the teacher, the human side is the most important thing. The technology should be there as an aid, not as the center of the class. Thank you very much for your time, and uh, if you have any questions or any discussions, any advice, please go ahead. Thanks very much.